So we're in the middle of our sermon series called Who's Whose life is it anyway? And the truth is, you know, our, when we hear that question, whose life is it anyway? I think, you know, if, if you're anything like me, you know, we live, in, we live in America, man. I'm independent. I'm fiercely independent. I pull myself up by my bootstraps. I mean, that's the kind of independent culture that we live in. And so when, when even that question is, is actually kind of hits me the wrong way, it makes me feel like, well, of course, my life is my own, right? But um, we're being reminded through Scripture that really everything we have, everything that we are, is a gift from God. It is something on loan to us that we can use in whatever way we choose to use it, but we are stewards, right? And so we talked about stewardship being caring for someone else's stuff in the way that the owner wants it cared for. And, and we've talked about the last few weeks that uh, that, that you know, that God is the owner of all of it. Uh, the earth is the Lord's and everything therein. And so, uh, so we've been reminded about that and, and how everything we have is on loan to us and it's our job to use it, yes, for, to meet our needs and those things, but also God has given us what we have and put it on loan to us so that we will invest it in kingdom things. And um, there is no other plan. It is, it, is, um, it is you. It is me. And so this morning we're just continuing on that journey. Last week we talked about one of the things, uh, obstacles that keeps us from being the kinds of steward God wants us to be. It is our fear. It is our anxiety. It is our worry about money and about time and about, will my time uh, you know, be well used? Do I have an, will my gifts make any difference? Uh, will my finances be enough? Will I have enough if I give to some? So uh, our fear keeps us from being good stewards. But today we're going to talk about another thing that keeps us from being good stewards and uh, really talking about the concept of idolatry. So I want to invite you to hear, this is a short verse. This is from Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. This is, we're just doing one verse today, and this verse actually precedes the verses that we studied last week. Last week we, we looked at uh, Matthew 6, 25 uh, through like 34. Today we're just going to look in verse 24. And I want you to hear what Jesus has to say. It's very direct, it's very straightforward, and, and it and it's, it's, can be a hard word to us, but it's something that we need to hear this morning. This is what Jesus says. He says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then he ends with these words, you cannot serve both God and money. Will you pray with me? God, thank you so much for today, and I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word that speaks. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that teaches us. God, we ask that those things would happen today. And God, I pray that you would uh, either now use me to speak a word or that you would move me out of the way and speak a word in spite of me. Either way, God, uh, we're here to be taught by you. And we pray these things as we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to ask you this morning, who is it that has you wrapped around their little finger? Right? Who is it that has you wrapped around their little finger? For some of you, it may be a child. For some of you, it may be a spouse. For some of you, it may be a niece or a nephew. I don't know who it is that has you wrapped around their little finger, but I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody probably has somebody. The truth is, um, uh, for me, that is um, my grandson, Weston, now that I'm his favorite. Um, um, it is certainly the case that there's pretty much nothing uh, I wouldn't do. Actually, it's, it's probably true that um, everybody in my family has me wrapped around their finger. Uh, you, know, it, you know, like the kids will say, hey, Dad, on your way home, will you get us some candy? I'm like, okay. And then Ginger will say, hey, uh, Matt, this, I, always, I always dread hearing these words. She'll say, will you do me a favor? Like, yes, dear. Right? But so they all have me wrapped around their finger, but certainly Weston right now is at the top of the heap. There's nothing I wouldn't do. So last weekend, Ginger was on a, uh, she was on a kind of a girl's weekend with one of her best friends from high school, and they went uh, up to Canton, this godforsaken 30,000 you know, I mean, booths all selling the same candles. I, I mean, that's, that's just what Canton is. And so they went to Canton uh, for the weekend. And, but while they were gone, uh, Jessica, our oldest daughter, said, hey, uh, Matt, will you keep Weston? Now, keeping Weston over a Saturday night for a preacher, that's a sacrifice, people. Saturday night is game time, okay? Because that's when I'm, I have two things that are on the agenda. Go back through my sermon one more time and 
um, and, and, and get some rest because I, I wake up early on, su- on Sunday morning. So, so that even in and of itself, I was like, okay, it's Weston. The answer is yes, I will do this. But I was, you know, I was already I was getting off on the wrong foot. But so we spent, you know, about half the day together. He came over in the afternoon and things were going well. He's a sweet little kid, you know, just, you know, just to get that little smile and that little giggle and all that kind of stuff. And so we went through the day and we're having a good day. And then it came close to bedtime. She told me to put him to bed between 7 and 8 o'clock. And, and so before Ginger left, I asked her, you know, give me some of the tips and tricks and that kind of stuff. So I used all the, all the grandfather, you know, uh, tricks that I, that I knew, things that I learned from when my kids were little. But I gave him a bath, right? Warm bath right before bedtime and put some of that, is it chamomile? I don't know what the stuff is that puts them to, what is it? Lavender, that stuff, yeah, lavender puts them to sleep, right? It's like, I don't know, but it's magic. And then so I put some lavender lotion on it and then got him ready for bed. And now Ginger likes to rock him, but he won't sit still for me, so I carried him around. So I carried him around the house, but before I carried him around the downstairs, I turned off all the lights. So the lights, I sent the kids upstairs and said, you better be quiet. If you wake him, you take him. And so, um, so I turned off... I turn off all the lights and I started to walk him. I walk him in a circle through our house. That's how I get him to go to bed. And so I walked him around. And friends, I was walking him for like a half hour, like 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. And he wasn't going to sleep. Walking around and around and around. My back's hurting. I'm tired. I'm, I'm starting to get cranky. I haven't had a chance to go through my sermon. I'm, I, I, one of these times around, he looked into the master bedroom where the, the crib is, where he would be sleeping. And he, and he, and he pointed. Now, Weston can't talk. Uh, very well yet. He can say a couple of things. He can say he he can say yes, but it doesn't sound like yes. It's s s, and then he can point at things. Uh, he can show you where he wants to go. He just points and leans, and he goes eh. Okay, so he can say s and eh. Those are his two things. Or ball. He can say ball ba. Bah. So those are the three things. So he points into our master bedroom and he points at the crib and he says eh. I'm like, okay, he wants to go in there. Maybe he wants me to lay him down. Maybe the carrying him was too much. Maybe I need to put him in the crib. So I carry him in there, and we get to the crib, and I'm thinking, oh, he wants to lay down. And he says, no. He points at one of the um, blankets, and he says, eh. I said, oh, he wants a blanket. Who knew? So I picked up a blanket. I said, is this the blanket that you want? And he puts his hand on it, and he rubs it, and he's like, he takes it, and he throws it on the ground. (laughs) I'll take that as a no. So then he looks at another blanket also hanging from the edge of the crib and he says, eh. I said, oh, you want that blanket? So I get that blanket and he and I says, is this the blanket you want? Puts his hand on it, rubs it, eh, throws it on the floor. This is not good. My grandson is a diva. So I finally, um, he's, there's one more blanket over there and he leans over, sure enough, leans over, he goes, eh. And so I get it, and I put it, is this the blanket? He throws it on the ground. Now, friends, I'm, I don't know like, what I'm going to do at this point. I'm thinking, you're a, you're a blanket snob, okay? This is, and if this was one of my kids, I promise you this. If it was one of my kids, I would have said, look, you're going to use this stinking blanket, and you're going to live with it. Because when, when it's your kid, you actually have to deal with the ramifications of spoiling them. But, friends, this is grandparent universe now we're living in. I could spoil him and send him home. So then I'm thinking, then I remembered something Ginger told me. She said, there is this blanket. It's a magic blanket in her house. It's this gray blanket. It's fuzzy. It's like eight feet long or something. And it resides in Grace's room. And so I said, aha, he's looking for the gray blanket. So, so I said, okay, oh, come on. And so we went upstairs and we got the gray blanket. And we came back downstairs and I said, is this the blanket that you want? And friends, he didn't even touch it. He said, S. And then he just leaned over on it. And if I'm lying, I'm dying. In 90 seconds, the kid was asleep. Diva. And so, and so I, but I I was like, I was so happy. And it didn't matter because if it helped him, if it made him feel better, I was willing to do it, right? Graham, he's got his papa, right? Wrapped around his, his finger. And eventually he fell asleep and no worries. Now, friends, it's cute when it's a grandson or a child or even a spouse. You can tell funny stories and it makes a half-decent sermon illustration. But the truth is, friends, there are many things that we sometimes get wrapped around. And sometimes those things are far more insidious. They are far more destructive. And Jesus mentions one of those things here today in just this brief verse, this one verse that we looked at this morning he mentions just one of the things that we can get wrapped around, and it can be very destructive. It's our money. And Jesus says it again. He says it very 
plainly here, very directly here. He says, look, you cannot serve two masters because you're either going to love this one and hate this one or you're going to love this other one and then you'll hate the first one. And then he goes on to say, you cannot serve both God and money. Some translations, you cannot serve both God and wealth. Now, I'm, I don't know about you, but you know, my first reaction to that is, well, Jesus you know, probably isn't talking to me. He's probably talking to those billionaires out there, right? He's talking to the people that have like the big yachts and they have 15 estates and they're sleeping on beds of, you know, Benjamin Franklin's and they burn cash and they, they have a little altar somewhere in their bedroom where they, sacrifice, they light candles and they sacrifice money to the God, uh, sacrifice, uh, you know, stuff to the God of, of money, right? And so we're thinking, he must not be talking to me because that's not me. I don't, I, I'm just working Joe, right? I mean, I, and, and we, think, we think he must be talking to somebody else. But friends, he's talking, he's talking to us too. He's talking to all of us. I, I, read, a, I read a story this week about a, a billionaire, actually on the top, like in the top five of the richest people on the planet. And he's got 15 estates and he's got two yachts over, uh, each one of them is over half of a football field long. And one of the things he likes to do is play basketball on his yacht. And, and no problem, though, if you, you know, because one of the downsides of playing basketball, I know this because, you know, I play basketball on my yachts all the time, um, is that if you play basketball on a yacht, um, if, you, if you miss or it hits or whatever, it, you know, air ball goes right over the side of the, of the yacht. No problem for this guy. You know why? Because while he's playing basketball on the yacht, he's got a speedboat in the water. So when he misses... Ball goes over the railing, speedboat just goes to get the ball and retrieves it and brings it back to him. Friends, surely Jesus is talking to him. He's not talking to me, right? But friends, he's talking to us too. He's talking to us, and he's talking to us about something that is very real. He's talking to us about idolatry. A simple definition that we can use this morning for idolatry. Anything, when any good thing, even a good thing, becomes a God thing, it's a bad thing. When any good thing becomes a God thing, it's a bad thing. It's something just very, very simple, right? Good things can become God things. We can, uh, we can take created things and we can put them on the throne of our lives where they never were meant to be. And friends, when that happens, that is idolatry. That is worshiping something else other than God. And so Jesus warns us here, you cannot have it both ways. You cannot serve God and serve money. If money is controlling your life, then God is not controlling your life. And so he gives us a warning, basically. But he's talking to us. Make no mistake. I mean, we, again, we want to say, well, because I'm not a billionaire, because I don't have this, because I don't have that, I don't have all this stuff, I'm not you know, burning money, I don't, all that stuff, and somehow he can't, he's not talking to me. I'm not doing all these terrible things, friends. That's not how idolatry works. Right? It's, that's not how idolatry works. Can I, can, I, can I just tell you how idolatry works? I don't know if any of you have ever seen the movie Broadcast News. I won't, I won't ask you to raise your hand because I'm afraid it'll just be me, okay? Um, this is a movie from like 1986 or something, and, um, and I, I'm not sure anybody watched it the first time, but I watched it, okay? And, and one of my favorite movie clips from this movie is this, it, was, it starred uh, like Albert Brooks and Holly Hunter and William Hurt or somebody. But Albert Brooks has this great kind of dialogue with one of the other characters where he talks about the devil. Now, it's not, a, it's not a religious movie. It's not about, it's about broadcast news. But he has this great monologue with, or dialogue, really, with another character where he talks about the devil. And when he says, he, he actually accuses one of the characters in the movie of being the devil. And when the person he's talking to just laughs out loud and scoffs at him, like, how ridiculous is that? He goes on this kind of diatribe about, about idolatry, about the devil, Right? And he basically says this, he says, look, do you think, do you really think that the devil, when the devil comes, does the devil show up in a red suit with a tail and a pitchfork going, ah? He says, of course he doesn't, he doesn't show up like that, because if he showed up like that, nobody would follow him. He says, no, what he does, what the devil does is he shows up, and when he shows up, he's beautiful. He's attractive. He's kind to everybody. He would never do anything that anybody would ever think was negative, but he will make sure he finds his way into places of influence and then one compromise at a time, he undercuts the, the godly culture that he's in. One little 
compromise here and one little compromise there. Friends, that is true of the devil, but it is, it is certainly true of money. It's true of idolatry. Idolatry doesn't happen as we burn uh, incense to the altar of money in our homes. That's not how idolatry happens. It happens one compromise at a time. It happens one bit at a time, one piece at a time. It's, it's that jealous thought about keeping up with the Joneses. If I just had what they had, I would be happy. It's that anxious thought, maybe I need to hold on to this rather than give to God what I know belongs to him because if I, if I give it away, I may not have enough for me. It's the, if I just told one little lie or did one little, I mean, it's just a little unethical thing. I could have a bigger bonus. I could get a bigger promotion. I could have a, a better office. Friends, it's one little compromise at a time. It doesn't happen all at once. It happens a little piece at a time until one day you wake up and you look and you see if you are given the grace to see God is no longer on the throne of my life. My stuff is on the throne of my life. My money has become my master. I am no longer in charge of it. It is in charge of me. My decisions are made based on what will get me the most and help me to keep the most. Now, I want to be clear this morning, friends. Money is not a bad thing. The Scriptures do not teach. Nowhere do the Scriptures teach that money is a bad thing. Money is a thing. It's not a bad thing or a good thing. The scripture, we, you hear people misquote the Scriptures all the time. They say, uh, the Bible t- doesn't the Bible say that you know, uh, money is the root of all evils? Friends, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.10... It says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils, and it goes on to say that some people eager for money, right, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Basically, as they ran after money, they walked away from God. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. So money's not bad. The the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, he didn't, you know, one of the things that he always encouraged is he taught about money in the Wesleyan societies and those earliest Methodist societies. What he did was he told them, he said, look, uh, here are the, here's how you should deal with money. You should earn all you can. Now he qualified that. You should earn all you can by honest means, right? You should earn all you can by honest means. And then he said, you should save all you can. And what he meant by that was you save all you can by simple living, and this is a guy who said, if I die with more than 20 pounds in my pocket, then you can call me a thief and a liar, right? I mean, this is a guy who lived a very simple existence, but you should save all you can. Why? So that you could give all you can. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. That's, what he, that's how he taught about money. Money's not a bad thing. Money's a thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a neutral thing. It can be used for good things. Money feeds the poor, Right? Money gives housing to battered women who have fled their homes. Money spreads the gospel around the world. Money can be a good thing. Money can be a bad thing. It can take over your life. It can become a god. It can master you rather than you mastering it. Friends, money's not a bad thing. Money's just a thing. But what Jesus is warning us is it can, you, you cannot serve both God and money. If you, by those little compromises here and there, if you put this created thing called money on the top of your life, on the throne of your life, you cannot be in relationship with God. God cannot be in control of your life. But if we stay connected, if we keep God on the throne, if we seek God passionately, if we seek to know what God says about money through the Scriptures, if we seek the Holy Spirit's guidance through prayer, if we seek God in community, if we really want to put our lives at the disposal of God, then God tells us what money is. He tells us how to use it. He tells us what to do with it and what not to do with it. Friends, in that case, God is in control, and you are then empowered to be the master of your own money, not your money being the master of you. Now, friends, I'm aware that every time I've ever preached on this, even when I read it, I have to admit that I kind of come at it from that direction of I think of all the bad stuff that can happen when money is in charge of me. Those moments, friends, when I start making decisions based on money, and by the way, Methodist preachers and all kinds of preachers are not exempt from any of these temptations. But when I start doing that, I think of all the bad things that can happen. Right? So we think of it from a negative direction. But friends, maybe the saddest thing about this statement that Jesus makes is not how bad money is. Maybe the saddest thing about this whole statement that Jesus makes is, is, the, is the missed opportunity to see how good God is. 
I mean, what he actually says is, right, what he says is you cannot serve both God and money. We think of it from, okay, what bad will happen if I serve money? But what if we thought about how much we will miss if we're not mastered by God, if we're not serving God, if God is not in the place where God alone deserves to be, friends, what have we thought about how sad that is? I mean, friends, I want you to think about the life that, that is available through Christ. I want you to think about what, what, what God says in the Scriptures about a life lived under His guidance, under His Godship, under His Lordship. Friends, Jesus says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. The prophet Jeremiah tells the people of Israel, even in the midst of some of their worst times, he says, but God is saying that he knows the, the, he knows the plans that he has for you. They are plans to give you a hope and a future, right? The life lived to God is a life-giving life. It is, a, it is an abundant life. Maybe the saddest thing about letting money become a God thing. This good thing that becomes a God thing and becomes a very bad thing, maybe the saddest thing there is because we would then be missing out on a life lived to God, a life that, that is abundant. You know, when I, when I put my life under God's lordship, it frees me up to love something more than my stuff. It frees me up to love my enemies and pray for people who persecute me. It frees me up to take what I have and invest it in something else. It frees me up to put trust in something other than my savings account or my retirement account. Friends, when, when my life is lived to God, there is life. Everything else is just holding on to stuff that's not going to be here, stuff that I cannot take with me. We tend to think of money and stuff and, and all that stuff as monopoly. We think, of, we think of life as monopoly, right? Where our job is to go around the, the track a few times and land on all the best properties and, and buy them up and put hotels on them and charge rent to everybody else. And, and our job is to kind of push everybody else out of the game, friends. That's how we tend to look at life. But friends, life is not monopoly. Life is better thought of as Uno. You guys remember Uno. With Uno, you, you're, the job is to get rid of all the cards. The job is to deploy all the cards in the service of the victory, right? And the victory in, in life, friends, is not defined by us. It's defined by God. It's God's victory. We deploy all of our cards in, in, in submission to God's victory. One more person being fed. One more prisoner being set free. One more sick person being visited one more person coming to know the grace and love and mercy of our God. Friends, those are victories. It's the job in our lives as followers of Jesus is not to gain all that we can so that we can hold on to it and push everybody else out in the game and, 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 and look down on them and, and laugh. The job of a follower of Jesus is to get rid of all of our cards. The things still left in your hand at the end, you don't get any credit for those. Friends, don't let your stuff own you. Don't let something, anything, even a good thing, become a God thing because, as Jesus says, that's a very bad thing. If you want to control your money rather than let your money control you, seek God. Seek Him through Scripture, through the Holy Spirit. Seek Him through other believers. Seek Him in, the, in, in a community of believers. Let God talk to you about what money is supposed to be and what it's supposed to do. Put it at his disposal. And friends, can I be clear before I close this morning? I, is, I hope you will hear my heart in this. I am not talking about giving to Parkway. <laughs> can I say that one more time to you? I am not talking about giving to Parkway. Okay, that's, I mean, I don't know if other preachers say that. They might get beat up if they say it, but I'm saying it. Okay, if you've been hurt by church, if you're skeptical and cynical of preachers like me standing up to tell you about money and trying to get more money and more this and that, then, then friends, don't give it to Parkway. Give it to some other kingdom thing that you believe in, but by, by all that is holy, friends, give it somewhere. If it's not here, give it somewhere. I, we give here. We tithe our full tithe to this place. If we want to give to something else, we give it beyond our tithe. But that doesn't have to be what you do. But friends, don't let your money 
be your master. You cannot serve both God and money. Let God define what your money is, is and what it's supposed to be, what it is and what it's supposed to do. Give back to God what is His. Listen to His leading. Seek Him. And then let Him be in control. It is a life-giving life. This is not about the church's need to receive. This is about the, our, us as givers, our need to put our stuff at God's disposal. Our need to give. Our need to open up our hands a little bit and say, all right, God, I know that this stuff is borrowed. It is yours. Friends, don't let your, don't let your money control you. Don't let your money be your master because if you do, you, are, you cannot be in relationship with God in that way. God, if, if, if your money's in control of you, God is not in control of you. Don't let a good thing, any good thing, but don't let a good thing become a God thing. Because as Jesus says, that's a very bad thing. 